Journey to Sainthood The Life and Times of the Servant of God Maurice Michael Cardinal Tunga with Asasha Elizabeth Hello there dear viewers, sending you warm greetings this chilly morning. Frozen stiff as we are, we are committed to bring you a conversation about uh, the journey to sainthood, life and times of the servant of God, Maurice Michael Cardinal Otunga, a man whose life, demeanor and everything about him bespoke of humility. And we continue to do this as we prepare for the 20th anniversary since uh, he went to be with the Lord who sent him to us as a gift, and a gift indeed that left a legacy ingrained not just in our hearts, but even in our lives. And right now I'm joined by Professor Njoroge Lawrence, who happens to be uh, the vice postulator in the process of beatification of the servant of God and a lecturer at the j -Quart. He also... Uh, uh, happened to be to to preach at the funeral of the late servant of God, and of course the servant of God also sponsored his book, Century A Century of, of the of Catholic Endeavor. Endeavor. That was the very first book. Mm -hmm. So right now, uh, Father, uh, before I start with the question, because there is quite a lot that we need to hear from you, because you are among the few who are lucky to interact closely with the late servant of God. Please uh, expound more about your accolades as a professor and a lecturer. Thank you very much indeed. First of all, I am very grateful to God for this opportunity. Mm -hmm. In a very special way, thankful to God because we are in the very, very place where the motto remains of the servant of God, rest. His remains were brought in this chapel in the year 2005. Many recall that he passed on in the year 2003. Two years later, it was decided that his remains be brought to the Resurrection Garden, the garden which he himself created. What is the rationale behind that? The, because the servant of God was a believer that human life has its meaning in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. that we are people on a journey. It is true that we have been created by God to live in this world, but that our final home, our final destination is what he himself, the servant of God, called the beatific vision seeing God face to face. And in order to see God face to face, we live our life of faith in this world and believe in the resurrection. And therefore, the servant of God created the resurrection garden in the late 80s and early 90s because he believed that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the guarantee, the ultimate guarantee of our trust and faith in God. And did the servant of God leave a will of where he would wish to be buried? Yes. When he passed on in the year 2003, the archive of the Archdiocese of Nairobi, the Chancellor of the Archdiocese of Nairobi, and the Archbishop of Nairobi then, Archbishop Dingi Mwana Anzaki, produced his will. Mm -hmm. And I remember very well the will was read at the Holy Family Basilica Priest House. Mm -hmm. The meeting was attended by Archbishop Dingi Mwana Anzaki. Priests and nuns and the faithful belonging to the Archdiocese of Nairobi mm -hmm 
had representatives from the family of the servant of God, mm -hmm. including the Nabutolas. Mm -hmm. And I am glad that one of the Nabutolas mm -hmm. is here. We'll get to speak to him Yes, shortly. yes. It is wonderful that he has been able to make this journey all the way from Bugoma in order to come mm -hmm. and join us as we celebrate the 20th anniversary of the passing on of the servant of God. Mm -hmm. The wheel was produced. I was then a secretary of the Archbishop of Nairobi, even as I had begun to teach at the Jomo Kenyatta mm -hmm. University of Agriculture and Technology. The wheel was indicated and uh, it was opened. I was asked to read the wheel we read the will of the servant of God, Morris mm -hmm. Michael Cardinal Tunga. The first component, he had reproduced the creed, I believe in God, the Father Almighty. And then, the in the, yeah, that was the preamble to the will, mm -hmm. uh, the Apostles' Creed. And then he thanked God because of his life, because of his family, because of his parents, because of his opportunity of serving, of his, not opportunity, because of his calling mm -hmm. to serve in the church as a priest, as a bishop, as an archbishop, and as a cardinal. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, having thanked God, he began distributing his earthly possessions. We are not going to go into that because that was pretty well covered mm -hmm. by the media later on, where he had left his earthly possessions. And then he indicated in his will that he wanted to be buried at St. Austin Cemetery. And he said, that is where the missionaries that is where my collaborators and co-workers, the religious sisters and brothers and priests and faithful are buried. Mm -hmm. I want to be buried together with them. Mm -hmm. And incidentally, he had indicated to two priests in the Archdiocese of Nairobi, mm -hmm. who were trustees of the Archdiocese of Nairobi, then the exact spot in St. Austin's where he wanted to be buried. He had indicated that to Father David Njoguna, who was one of the vicars general of the Archdiocese of Nairobi, mm -hmm. and to Father Pelin de Souza, who was also a vicar general. Both of them have, have passed on. Mm -hmm. And he had indicated that he wanted to be buried next to the original grave of Bishop Joseph Shanahan. Bishop Joseph Shanahan was the Irish Holy Ghost Bishop, who in the year 1939 had confirmed the servant of God, given the sacrament of confirmation mm -hmm. to the servant of God at Kaba High School before the servant of God the following year trans transited to Mangu High School. Mm -hmm. He had received his confirmation from Bishop Joseph Shanahan. Bishop Shanahan died in Kenya. Mm -hmm. He was buried in Kenya mm -hmm. at St. Austin's. And then later, his remains were removed from Kenya and reburied in the cathedral of Onicha in Nigeria, mm -hmm. because he had been a bishop in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. But we are talking about the servant the of servant God, Morris, of God. Morris Michael Cardinal mm -hmm. Tunga. Mm -hmm. He was buried there because he had indicated, that is at St. Austin's, mm -hmm. because he had indicated that he wanted to be buried there. So later there were later con consultations, mm -hmm. yes, can you ask the question? Okay, so later on, uh, we understand that later the, uh, his mortal remains were removed, and here we are at his memorial chapel, and this is where the remains are preserved. Yes. What uh, occasioned that? There were consultations that uh, happened, mm -hmm. and the consultations were uh, the then Archbishop of Nairobi, Archbishop Dingi Mwana Anzaki, 
was in conversation with the faithful of the Archdiocese of Nairobi mm -hmm. and with members of the family. There are many people who come to visit the Resurrection Garden. The Resurrection Garden is one of the major legacies of the servant of God. Mm -hmm. It is a pivotal legacy. It is a most important legacy because the Resurrection Garden is a statement in itself by the servant of God as to what he believed. That he believed in the love of God and in life after death, in the embrace of believers of God by the Father. Mm -hmm. That is why he created the Resurrection Garden. Mm -hmm. And therefore, after a number of conversations of various people and the apostolic nuncio, who was then uh, Archbishop Lebepon, the Frenchman, there were consultations. There are many people who want to visit the resting place of the servant of God. Mm -hmm. St. Austin's is fine because he had indicated he wanted to be buried there. But there were issues of space to begin with because there are many other persons buried there. And uh, there is the resurrection garden, which is a statement of what he believed in. And therefore, the view was put forward. Why aren't the mortal remains of the servant of God transferred from where he was buried, because his will was honored. He was buried where he had indicated he wanted to be buried. Therefore, there was no infringement. There was no moving away from his will. He was buried, it was honored. He was buried where he had indicated he wanted to be buried. And then the argument was, why don't we take his remains. So that when the resurrection comes, he himself is going to be resurrected from the resurrection garden which he created. It is the resurrection garden. And he was saying to the Kenyan faithful and to the faithful in East Africa and to all the faithful in the world, we are believers in the resurrection. And therefore, the argument was, let us bring his remains to the place that uh, symbolizes the resurrection for him, mm -hmm. so that when the resurrection comes, he is going to arise uh, from there. Very fast. Precisely. Thank you Precisely. Very you much. put it very well. Thank you very much, yes. Professor. Now, you were among the lucky ones to, who, have, who had to interact with uh, his eminence. What would you say the servant of God was? How would you describe him? Because many people speak of humility. Some say he was so humble. Mr. Moura, uh, Peter, who accompanied him uh, to go and receive the red hat, also attests to the fact that he's the servant of God uh, exemplified humility among the people of God. What would you say yourself? Yes, thank you very much. Among the many qualities, the many virtues the servant of God had, including the virtue of humility, you have mentioned that, mm -hmm is the virtue of a person who trusted God and trusted human beings that were working with him. Mm -hmm. The servant of God had a special regard for the institution of the family. First of all, he believed that we are the family of God. Mm -hmm. Human beings constitute the family of God. Mm -hmm. And he had special regard for the human family. One cannot speak of the servant of God without bringing in the idea and the reality of the Christian family and of the people of God as a family. Mm -hmm. First of all, when he came to Nairobi as the Archbishop of Nairobi. He came in the year 1969 as co-adjutor to Archbishop J.J. McCarthy. And then he took possession of the Archdiocese in the year 1971, October of the year 1971. Mm -hmm. One of his first acts 
was to form the Family Life Association of Kenya. And he founded that in the commonly known as FLAC. He founded that in the Archdiocese of Nairobi. Mm -hmm. And he brought in Catholic faithful who are experts in matters of the family. Mm -hmm. He brought in a gentleman called Dr. Andrew Cura and his wife, Jean Cura, together with Sister Stanila, Stanislas Barry of the Religious Sisters of Mercy. And they founded the FLAC. The work of the FLAC was to promote solid family values because he saw right from that time that the family is endangered. The family is endangered because of loss of values. Mm -hmm. And therefore, among his many attributes, among his many qualities, and among the aspects of his legacy, that a need to be stressed is that the servant of God, Maurice Cardinal Tunga, encouraged people and he helped people to support the family as an institution mm -hmm. and the family as a communion of love mm -hmm. and of where people care for each other. And the evidence of that can be seen in his founding the FLAC, together with uh, Dr. Andrew Cura, Mrs. Jean Cura, and the Sister Stanislaus Abari. As I have mentioned in my book, I have narrated that in page 452 of the book, Beyond the Century of Endeavor. And specifically, when it comes to the protection of the family, and the protection of family values, he promoted natural methods of um, population planning, the natural method. Mm -hmm. And he did that together with the, the curas and together with the sister Stanislas Barry. Mm -hmm. At the same time, he invited international experts to come to Kenya and to come to the Archdiocese of Nairobi in order for them to train the faithful in Kenya regarding family values. Mm -hmm. He invited the internationally renowned Dr. John Billings and Dr. Evelyn Billings. They were Australians. They had become his friends because when he was being created cardinal in the year 1973, he first went to Australia. And he went to Australia because he was great friends with Archbishop Knox. And Archbishop Knox, who then later became Cardinal Knox, on the same, same day as Cardinal Otunga, mm -hmm. Archbishop Knox was Father Otunga's rector in Rome in the 1940s. He had been taught by Monsignor Knox in Rome. Mm -hmm. And then later in the 1950s, Monsignor Otunga became the secretary of the apostolic delegate who was James Knox mm -hmm. with his headquarters in Mombasa. And therefore, Archbishop Knox taught Cardinal Otunga in Rome when he was a student, a seminarian in Rome, mm -hmm. And then Father Otunga became secretary to Archbishop Knox. And then both of them, Monsignor Otunga and Monsignor James Knox, were created cardinal on the same day in March 1973. Yeah, that's quite an interesting. It's, it's Therefore, before he went to Rome, mm -hmm. Cardinal Otunga as Archbishop Otunga went to Melbourne, to Australia, mm -hmm. and he became very, very good friends with the Billings. We were talking about uh, Dr. John Billings and Dr. Evelyn Billings. Mm -hmm. And they were medical, both of them were medical doctors. 
and they were the founders of what is known as the Billings Method, mm -hmm. the ovulation Billings Method or Billings Ovulation Method. Cardinal Tunga invited them later to Nairobi in order to come and train couples in Kenya regarding family values, including proper ethical values in the family. Mm -hmm. And therefore, to answer your question, Cardinal Tunga will be remembered, and we owe him a great debt of gratitude because Without the family, there is no society. Mm -hmm. And one of the major aspects of the apostolate of the servant of God was the promotion of good family values. Mm -hmm. To conclude that question, I was in discussion with uh, a person who is now in his 90s. He is in the parish where I am serving, mm -hmm. St. Augustine's Parish in Georgia. Mm -hmm. The man's name is Mr. Peter John Mude, and he told me a beautiful story. How Cardinal Tunga came to confer the sacrament of confirmation at uh, St. Teresa's Parish Kalimoni in the 1970s. And then, after conferring the sacrament of confirmation, he invited members of the parish pastoral council mm -hmm. to come to his residence in Lovington that he was going to give them a cup of tea, a party. And he told them, when you come to my residence in Lovington, bring children. Do not forget, as families, as husbands and wives, bring children with you, because children are part of the family. And how they came as a group, from St. Teresa's Parish, Kalimoni in Judea, they came to Cardinal Tunga's residence in Lovington, mm -hmm. and he had prepared a good meal for them. And he himself served them food. He served them f meat. Mr. Jugona, Mr. Mude was very, very specific about that. That the servant of God, in his clerical vestments, served food to the parishioners from St. Teresa's parish, including the children. And wow. he thanked them because they had brought children mm -hmm. to come and visit, with them to come and visit him. Mm -hmm. What am I trying to say? Asasha Elizabeth, yes, the yes. servant of God, believed in solid Christian Catholic families where there was faith, hope, and love, mm -hmm. where there was generosity and change, and where there was sacrifice, where people sacrificed for each other, for the common good, for the good of the family. Because if there is no family, according to the servant of God, there is no society and there is not going to be a church. Mm -hmm. Eventually, we are the family of God as Christian Catholics. Thank you very much. That was quite profound. And uh, as a Professor of Vouchers, uh, the servant of God was known to be a very vehement critic uh, to the contraceptives and you remember at some point in the 90s he had to set ablaze some contraceptives before the faithful and uh, he held strongly and staunchly that these went against the human uh, teachings of uh, uh, the God's teachings about uh, the family and it is something that uh, uh, Father Andrew Lawrence is uh, attesting to right now that's just something that I came across trying to understand this man of God who really has left a great impact, not just in our faith, but even in the way we live as Catholic faithfuls. And uh, Professor, you spent weeks at uh, the ancestral home of the late servant of God. You penned down a very strong uh, biography of him. What would you tell us about uh, his uh, professional life? Yes, first of all, I am very grateful mm -hmm. to the family of the servant of God, Maurice Michael Cardinal Tunga, because they were gracious, mm -hmm. they were generous to me. 
Two years ago, they invited me to their home, and I was able to go to very, very important spots. The very, very spot where the servant of God was born in Chebukwa, mm -hmm. and there is a tree that has been, that has been planted, mm -hmm. and it is near that tree mm -hmm. where the servant was born at Chebukwa. And one can see in the distance the home of uh, the uh, brother of the servant of God, mm -hmm. uh, the late Honorable Mr. Henry Carey, who was a member of parliament. One can see his home mm -hmm. from that very, very spot. Incidentally, the servant of God was given that piece of ancestral land by the Suri Namachanja family. It was willed to him. Mm -hmm. And he himself willed it back to the church. And therefore, the Diocese of Bungoma now is in control, owns that particular uh, piece of uh, land. I am grateful to the Sudi Namachanja family. I am very grateful to the Nabutola family, and I am glad that one of them is here because I was able to spend uh, almost two weeks in Bungoma being taken to various spots that are connected with the life of the servant of God. As I mentioned, I was able to visit the area of his bath, and I will share photographs of the spot with you, mm -hmm. Sasha Elizabeth. I really appreciate Yes, I was shown the house where the servant of God grew up, the main residence of the Paramount chief, Sudi Namachanja. Mm -hmm. A magnificent house. It has been renovated recently. The servant of God uh, grew up there part of his life before he went to study at Kaba, and then later went to Gaba in Uganda and later to Rome. Mm -hmm. I was shown the place where his late mother, Mother Rosa, where she used to go to church before she passed on. And therefore, I was shown the private property, the personal property of the family, and I was also shown places connecting the family to matters of faith. Mm -hmm. Therefore, the church where the mother of the servant of God uh, worshipped, because Eventually, she became a Catholic mm -hmm. and uh, was very, very faithful as a parishioner in a particular church. Mm -hmm. And I was taken to the mausoleum where the remains of the father of the servant of God, Paramount Chief, Sudi Namachanja, is buried. Mm -hmm. And there is a very fine a picture of the servant of God. The very, very picture I see in front in mm. this chapel. Mm. And therefore, it was for me a very, very happy moment, a very emotional moment, because I was touching base with the family of the servant of God, and I experienced one reality I must mention. Mm -hmm. The servant of God was a very generous person and a very kind person. He helped people and he never abandoned people in their difficulties. When things were going well, the servant of God was there with you. When a person was going through agony, the servant of God was there with you. If you visited the servant of God at his residence in Lovington, one of the things he did was to welcome you, and he would personally serve you tea and biscuits. That was his signature, mm -hmm. tea and, and his biscuits. biscuits. Mm -hmm. And he did not ask what people call house workers or, or cooks or servants to come and do that. Mm -hmm. He served you himself, just as he did with Mze Mude, mm -hmm. the one from the Kalimone parish I mentioned earlier on. Mm -hmm. The generosity and the welcome 
of the servant of God is mirrored and it is reflected and I could see its origin. Because the Sudi Namachanja family and the Nabutolas are very, very generous people. Wow. For, two and, for two weeks I lived there, I was very happy. Mm-hmm. I have never eaten so much ugali. It was very well. And Ingoho. And Ingoho. All uh, everything. I was going to come. I was going to come to that. And my, my brother here, Nabutola, you, you must have... took me. Mm-hmm. He took to the various places, mm-hmm. including the places where the wars with the British, the uh, Bukusu people fought wars with the British. Mm-hmm. He took me to the two areas where those wars were fought, but I was given a tremendous welcome. Mm-hmm. And therefore, it was contact with the family and the generosity of the family, and then connection with the places of the church, the church where the mother of the servant of God worshipped, mm-hmm. and then schools. I was taken to the very, very school where the servant of God began school in standards one up to four before he later went to Kaba, mm-hmm. a school in Ukambani. Mm-hmm. And then later, I was taken to the Ekatro Center that has been set up in the area and uh, which commemorates the service of the father of the servant of God, Paramount Chief Suri Namachanja, mm-hmm. and uh, which has artifacts from the family. And uh, it is a wonderful place to be in. And uh, there are now plans that the, these places are going to be developed as education institutions or institutions that are going to serve community and perhaps even a, a university that commemorating the servant of God is going to come up in order to secure the legacy of the servant of God. That's quite I, deserving. I would like to add word in that connection. Mm-hmm. I had the great fortune of serving as the education secretary of the servant of God. I was his education secretary. Mm -hmm. Besides being his pro-secretary, I was not his main secretary. Mm -hmm. The main secretary was Father Gashunga, the late Father Francis Gashunga. Before Father Gashunga, there was Father McBride. Father McBride, Father Gashunga, but when they were not in, Mm -hmm. I would be asked to be, I would step in. Mm -hmm. However, I was his substantive education secretary. In the year 1981 and the year 1982, one of his great legacies was the promotion of education, Catholic education, education that has values. He not only supported the established schools, like Mangu High School, which is his alma mater, He attended Mangu High School from 1940 to 1943, Mm -hmm. when he sat his Cambridge school certificate in the year 1943. Mm -hmm. I have uh, a record of it here with me. Before that, he was in Kabam. When he came in as our Archbishop in the year 1971, Mm -hmm. he supported the established schools, such as Mangu High School, such as St. Mary's School, which is very near not too far away from St. Mary's School, which is in Lovington. He supported schools like Muhoho High School and St. Joseph's High School, Gedongori, which is my alma mater. And then he founded new institutions, especially institutions in needy areas, such as the Gyo in Limuru. He founded the St. Mary's School, Gao School, Thigyo, because he wanted to promote the education of the girl child. And he founded a school in Kaba, Kapa, Kerita, Kamba, Kerita, a Gao school. And then he founded the school in Karinga, Gao. He looked at and he worked with the parishioners in a given parish. What do we need here? Whenever he went for confirmation, he always had a consultation with members of the parish pastoral council. 
And one of the questions that he discussed with them, what are we doing about education in this area? Mm -hmm. And then they will come up with the answers. The people themselves, mm -hmm. they would say what their real needs are. And then he would collaborate with them in terms of uh, ideas, in terms of material resources, in terms of spiritual resources, and they would put up the institution that is needed in that area. That's Finally, in terms of education, mm -hmm. he was very particular that the Catholic faith and that Catholics in a given community are served in matters of the spirit and in matters of faith. Let me give an illustration. Estereo Boys Centre and School. It is not Catholic. It was founded by the late Dr. Jeffrey Griffin in the year 1958. Mm -hmm. And therefore, it, here was an institution that was founded in order to address the needs of needy persons in the city and in the surrounding areas and from all over the country. Stareho Boy Center. This is the point I would like to make. The servant of God was able to enter into an understanding, entered a memorandum of understanding with Dr. Jeffrey Griffin for a Catholic chaplain to be posted on a permanent basis so that the Catholic students and members of staff in that school would be catered for spiritually. And he did an incredible thing. He was able to make an arrangement where the Blessed Sacrament would be preserved in the chapel of the school because there was a chaplain. And therefore, the Catholic students and the Catholic members of staff would be able to receive a very, very good education. And part of the very good education included the being formed in the Catholic faith, even though it was not a Catholic school. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the servant of God supported Catholic schools, the ones that had been established. He began new ones, number two. Number three, he was able to go out and to negotiate with the, the authorities in schools that are not Catholic mm -hmm. so that Catholic students are taken care of. At the Alliance High School, for example, mm -hmm. he was able to make an arrangement where the famous Professor Joseph G. Dondas would be able to go and celebrate the Eucharist for the, for the students there at the Alliance, boys and girls, mm -hmm. on Sundays, so that they may be taken care of. Spiritually. Yes, spiritually. Great. The servant of God was the promoter of family values and of good, holistic education that had uh, values and uh, the kind of education where people are not just informed, the cognitive dimension of education, but where people are formed. Therefore, people are informed and the students are formed holistically. As you, holistically as human beings. Wow, that's quite great and uh, very commendable spiritual nourishment nowadays because we understand the Catholic uh, educational institutions are uh, rooted in holistic formation, not just about the pedagogical aspect of it, but also the spiritual formation, not just in forming, but forming as a whole. Thank you for the, the details, uh, uh, Professor Njoroge. Now, briefly... Uh, could you please tell us about uh, you preaching at the funeral mass of the late servant of God? Is it something you had anticipated? Is it something you had looked for? Or no, is there no, a position? No, no, no. I had not. Mm -hmm. The first thing I would like to say is that there is one person here, Joan Odawa, mm -hmm. who was present at that mass. When we bid a final farewell to the servant of God, one of the persons involved in the organization of that liturgy 
is a person who is present here with us, Joan Odawa. <laughs> no, I did not, and then of course the Nabutola, the Nabutola is here, a member of the family of Nabutola, he was there. I don't know, Sister Esther, I know Sister Esther was connected very much with the servant of God, but she took her final vows from the servant of God. Yes, she took her final vows from the servant of God. Let me answer your question. No, I had not anticipated being asked to preach at the funeral of the servant of God. It is true that I was a member of the committee that organized the final farewell for the servant of God. The committee was constituted by Archbishop Dingi Mwananzeki. The committee was chaired by the Reverend Father Dominic Wamugunda because he was the chairman of the clergy of the Archdiocese of Nairobi mm -hmm. in those days. And therefore, Archbishop um, Dingi Mwananzeki said, our chairman, we have a chairman who is the chair of the the assistant priest, he is going to chair this committee. And uh, I was asked to be secretary because previously I was Archbishop Dingi's secretary and I had, I had been pro-secretary to the servant of God. Therefore, I was asked to be secretary to that committee. Archbishop Dingi Mwananzeki called me to his office and he told me he has had consultations with a number of people. He did not tell me who he had consulted. And it had been decided that one of the priests from the Archdiocese of Nairobi would be the one to deliver the homily at the funeral mass of the servant of God and that uh, he had had conversations with the relevant people. Because when he said that, I was a bit taken aback. But I was not even completely taken aback. He then proceeded and said, uh, it has been suggested that you preach at the funeral mass of the servant of God. It was mind-blowing, knowing who the servant of God is and was, mm -hmm. because he still is. I can even feel the spirit of the servant of God exactly where we are. Mm -hmm. And then knowing that he had, uh, he, first of all, he was the first Kenyan uh, bishop, 1957. When he was nominated, he was 33 years because he was nominated in November 1956 and then consecrated bishop the following year, 1957. He was nominated cardinal when he was 49 years and became cardinal just immediately after his 50th birthday. He was born in 1923 became Cardinal in 1973. Cardinal aged 50, and the first Cardinal in Kenya. And then the man's goodness and holiness, because I have not a doubt that Maurice Cardinal Otunga was a good and holy man. Recently, a good and holy man lived among us. I have no doubt about that. And to be asked to preach at his funeral, there are bishops in Kenya and cardinals in Eastern Africa. It was Cardinal Pengo from Dar es Salaam who was sent by the Holy Father, JP2, now a saint, and a great friend of the servant of God. Cardinal Pengo was asked to be the main celebrant. I discovered later through my research that consultations had been done with the nuncio and with people in Rome and that permission was given for me to preach. And therefore, I preached briefly regarding who the servant of God was to us 
and why the servant of God continues to be an inspiration, not only to the people and faithful in Kenya, we have a person whose impact and whose goodness goes beyond the border boundaries of this country to East Africa and beyond. A person who has had, who has a global impact. I have friends, for example, who came, who knew him in the United States, where he conducted a major missionary journey in the year 1962-1963, beginning from the west coast of the U.S. up to the east coast, preaching the good news, the gospel, and also doing some fundraising for the church in Kenya. There are persons in the United States who have utmost regard and respect for the servant of God. Persons at the University of Duquesne, for example, around by the Holy Ghost Fathers. And he always visited the University of Duquesne because it had Holy Ghost connections. Persons, Holy Cross priests at the University of Notre Dame where I studied. It was him that invited the priests of Holy Cross to come and begin the parish in Dandora in this country. The Reverend Father Bill Bloom. What I am saying is this, there are persons in all parts of the world, in Australia, in Asia, in Europe, in North America, in South America, who respected the servant of God in a wonderful way. For example, when St. Paul's Chapel of the University of Nairobi was opened officially in the year 1970, I was there. I was then a seminarian. And the chapel, St. Paul's Chapel of the University of Nairobi, whose building began in the year 1969, the plaque was blessed by Pope Paul VI in Uganda. Catholics from the University of Nairobi took the plaque to Uganda. It was blessed by Paul VI. It was brought back. The building was put up and a further Cummings, and then it was opened in the year 1970. I was then doing first year philosophy at St. Thomas Aquinas Seminary in Nairobi. The servant of God then asked Archbishop, he was not a cardinal then, he was auxiliary of coadjutor of the Archdiocese of Nairobi, and it was a friend of his who came from India an archbishop to come and consecrate St. Paul's Chapel of the University of Nairobi. What I am saying, and the Resurrection Garden exactly where we are. Mm -hmm. This place, he was supported by the Cardinal Archbishop of Milan, the Cardinal Archbishop of Philadelphia, and many other people. Cardinal Otunga's impact is global. We feel it here in Kenya. I can feel it now. And there are many people in various parts of the world who know Cardinal Otunga as a good and holy man. Indeed, that's quite great and it's quite inspiring knowing that one of uh, uh, our own, the very first uh, Cardinal in Kenya, and uh, was also the first uh, uh, bishop, Archbishop here, uh, is a global figure in the best and good reasons. And uh, just to very fast as we conclude so that we get to speak to uh, Mr. Wafula Nabutola, the family member, yes. and Mrs. Joanne Odawa, yes. who represents the committee, I, I have two questions two or three, two. We, and uh, we'll try as much as possible to make this uh, brief. And uh, one, we have been commemorating um, or holding memorial masses every year to mark uh, uh, or in honor of the servant of God, Morris Michael Cardinal Otunga. As we head towards the 20th anniversary on 6th of September, is there something special that is going to be done on this time round? Yes. 
I was taught Presi in high school, therefore I am going to be brief. Our Archbishop, His Grace Philip Agnolo, has asked the faithful of the Archdiocese of Nairobi and persons of goodwill in the Archdiocese of Nairobi and in Kenya to mark the 20th anniversary of the departure of the servant of God in a very special way. And we are going to mark it in a very special way. And there are several reasons for that. Already, Maurice Cardinal Otunga is a servant of God. The Archbishop of Nairobi is the petitioner, meaning he has asked the dicastery in Rome, which is the department in Rome that deals with the beatification and um, canonization of saints, to promote the servant of God to the next level which my sister Esther will tell us, she is a specialist in that, is the level of venerable. Therefore, number one, our own Archbishop, Philip Agnolo, is inviting us to pray in a very fervent way, to pray seriously. I will even say pray seriously, so that the servant of God is promoted to the next level uh, because the conditions for his elevation to the next level from the point of view of the Archdiocese of Nairobi have been fulfilled and therefore we are waiting to hear from Rome regarding what happens in that regard and therefore our business is to pray so that the will of God is going to be done and that the servant of God will become venerable. Secondly, Sister Esther Wangui and I in the Beatification Office, together with the Central Committee, and there is a renewed Central Committee that was commissioned last week by our Archbishop Philip Agnolo, and which is headed by the Reverend Father Peter Kaiwa who is the Catholic chaplain at the University of Nairobi. He is now the chairman of the Central Committee. We have committed ourselves as a committee and as an office to work very, very hard so that we continue collecting evidence and data regarding miracles performed through the intercession of the servant of God. And I would like to take this opportunity. If there is any person, faithful person out there who knows that they have received a, spe a very, very special favor in terms of healing through the intercession of the servant of God, Maurice Michael Cardinal Otunga, kindly get in touch with the beatification office in Nairobi so that Sister Esther Ishogo and I may collect that evidence. Once we have collected that evidence, we are going to transmit it to the relevant office in Rome. We are putting out that appeal because we believe that through the intercession of the servant of God, uh, there are persons who have received special favors from God in that regard. And therefore, you had asked me to be brief. We would like to mark this 20th anniversary in a very, very special way as an act of thanksgiving to God because of the gift of the servant of God, Maurice Cardinal Otunga, because Maurice Cardinal Otunga, servant of God, was God's special gift to us in Kenya. And I can tell you one thing, Sasha Elizabeth and the person viewing. The day 
that the servant of God, Maurice Michael Cardinal Otunga, is going to be declared saint. It is not going to be another fast because he has many, many fasts. The first bishop in Kenya, the first cardinal in Kenya. He served also in the finance committee of the Vatican. That has not been mentioned. He was in the committee that was administering the finances of the Universal Church and the first Kenyan to do so and the first African to do so. There were other Africans that served in various dicasteries in Rome, but he was the first one to work in the finance dicastery or department that deals with the finances. Therefore, he has enjoyed many, many premier, many first positions, the first of his kind in one, two, three, four. When he is finally declared saint, canonized saint, for me, that is going to be a kairos for this country the highest moment for this country. Because for the first time, a son of this soil, a child of this soil, will have been included in the universal calendar of saints of the Catholic Church. And therefore, we will be able to mention his name as a saint at mass and in other prayers. For me, there cannot be a greater fast that is going to be what I will call a kairos, the highest possible moment. And we are looking forward to that, and we are praying seriously for that day. Thank you very much. Indeed, it's going to be uh, the greatest moment, not just uh, to Catholic faithfuls, but to everyone who holds this dear country at heart as a... Uh, uh, very, very, we call them the Wazalendo Wainchi in Swahili. All right, so now, uh, finally, could you just tell us, I wanted to know briefly about, uh, there was a point, the servant of God was uh, at uh, a home of the elderly? Yes. Was that something he oh, had that planned? Is, that, or? Is one, that is one of the greatest decisions and moments in the life. A moment and a period, an event. I was then a priest at the Holy Family Basilica. I remember the year was 1999 or thereabouts. I was serving as secretary to Archbishop Dingi Mwananzaki. I served as secretary to Archbishop Dingi Mwananzaki from 1998 to the year 2001. I was summoned by Archbishop Dingi Mwananzaki to his office at the Holy Family Basilica. And he said to me, His Eminence Cardinal Otunga has a very important announcement to make to Catholics of the Archdiocese and the Catholics in the country and the persons of good will in the country. Catholics in the Archdiocese, in the country, and all persons of good will in the country. And he would like to make it on, in two weeks' time. And therefore, I would like to ask you to get in touch with media houses and ask them to be present during the 11 o'clock mass. His eminence is going to come from Numba, uh, from uh, his house, from his residence, because he was then residing. He was then residing with uh, Archbishop Dingi in Lovington. Therefore, ask the gentlemen and uh, ladies of the media to come, the persons of the media to come, get in touch with all the media houses, both local and international. Ask them to be at the Holy Family Basilica, Mass at 11. The servant of God has, an, he was not servant of God then, but he was servant officially, but he was servant of God in reality. In reality. Yes, Maurice Cardinal Tunga, his eminence, has an important announcement. 
And therefore, I listened, I obeyed, I got in touch with uh, all the media houses. And I will never forget that day. He came accompanied by Father Pius Bekesa of the Archdiocese of Nairobi and Father Dominic Kianduma of the Archdiocese of Nairobi. He was received at the entrance, the side entrance of the basilica through the, near the sacristy by a number of people, including Mrs. Joan Odawa, who is here with us. She is one of the persons that received him that Sunday. The Mass was being celebrated by Father Patrick Washege, who was then teaching at the University of Nairobi. It was a regular Sunday Mass. Archbishop Dingi was not even there. It was a regular Sunday Mass. He was received at the entrance by Joan Odawa. I have recorded that because I kept notes about that. I have recorded that in this book regarding that particular event. And Maurice Cardinal Tunga did not concelebrate at the Mass. He sat in a special seat. He sat there, and I can see him seated there with Father Wekesa on one side and Father Dominic Kienduma on the other side. Mass went on as usual until the time of the announcements, and then he was invited to come and make the announcement. Persons the fourth estate, I think you are called, you are all there, ready it's to hear what is pre precisely. He walked slowly, very, very slowly and steadily. One could see that he, he had aged. But he, and then he went to the lectern, to the umbrella, with a very, very clear voice. He greeted the people, and then when he thanked God because of his vocation and the opportunity he had been given by God to serve the people of God in the Catholic Church. And then he said he had an important announcement to make. And when he said that, you could see the persons of the media waiting for that moment, eagerly. eagerly. And then he said, I have come to tell you one thing, and basically one thing. As our Lord said to us in the Gospels, I have come to tell you and to tell Kenyans, love one another. you could have heard a pin drop. And then thirdly, he said, I have decided that I am going to live henceforth with persons of my own Rika, persons of my own age group, at the Nyumba Yawaze in Raraka. He paused and said, love one another. And calmly and slowly, he walked back. That to was his, all. That was, I had quite some trouble. That was all. He had simply come to say, love one another, and I am going to live with persons of my, I'm going to live with my agents. That is why he had asked me to, I had been asked to call all the media houses, both local and international. And I was in touch with all the media houses. I was in touch with the international 
media. They were there. In fact, the news spread, and it spread not only here locally, it was global news that Kaidno Tunga had elected to leave the Archbishop's residence in Lavington. And he had a room there. The place had been prepared in order for him to go and occupy a small little room. And the story does not end there because Simon, uh, uh, the driver called Mwangi, who was the driver of Archbishop Dingi Mwananzeke and who was also helping Kadno Otunga, was asked the following day to take Kadno Otunga to the new residence. I have narrated the story here. He drove him there in the old Audi, the old, old car, which Cardinal Tunga was using occasionally. And Mwangi told me the story. He thought he was going to leave. And he told me they carried just a few, just a few bags, that's all, a few things. He transported him there. They were well received by the little sisters there who, take, who took care of the home. And Mwangi, Samson Mwangi, that was his name, and he's still around. Not was, is his name because he's still around. He is somewhere in Nakuru. He thought he was going to leave his eminence at a Nyumba Yawaze together with a car. And then his eminence looked at him and told him, because he was handing over the car to the sister, the car and the keys to the sisters. And he told him, Samson, the car belongs to the Archdiocese of Nairobi. Take it back where it belongs. He was left absolutely with nothing there except his own possessions. Therefore, he took that decision himself. And there, it was a, an incredible decision. The Chancellor, then Chancellor of Moy University, Professor Bithwell Ogot, who celebrated his, I think, 94, 91st or 94th birthday, and we would like to wish him a very, very happy birthday. He did a piece on Cardinal Tunga's decision, noting the fact that here is a prince of the church who had left a palace in Lavington to go and live in an ordinary room. Because it was not special, an ordinary room in Nyumba Ewaze. And the remarkable thing is leaving a palace in order to go and live in an ordinary room with persons of your own age. That was Cardinal Otunga. The wow. of the I would say there's never been humility exemplified to that extent so far. I could not agree more. I'm just lost for words, indeed. And uh, we just continue to pray. We continue to do our best as Catholic faithfuls as we hope and look for, the, for that great day when God will deem it right and apt for the servant of God to be a saint. In two minutes, Professor, what is your duty as the vice postulator in this process of beatification of the servant of God? Uh, my calling and my job description is to work with the postulator who is in Rome in order to supply all the information and all the insights that are required by the process. Sister Esther Wangui will be describing to you what the process is. There are very stringent requirements. For example, regarding the gathering of information on miracles. Therefore, my work is to liaise 
between the church in Kenya. And by the church in Kenya, we mean the petitioner, Archbishop Philip Anyolo, and the faithful in Kenya. Not just the archbishop, but the faithful in Kenya. Because the making of a saint is the making that has its roots and that has material and form from the faithful. It is the faithful who are impacted upon in their lives by the servant of God. And therefore, it is not simply a clerical matter dealing only with the priests and the nuns and bishops. It is the people of God. And therefore, my work is to liaise. And my work is to work with the church in Kenya. So you are in the Archdiocese. So you have you have uh, you are working in collaboration or directly with the the Vatican Diocese yeah, Kosovo. Yes, with Saint the apostle. I report Sister Esther Wangui, who is the administrator in the beatification office, because I am the vice postulator, meaning director of the process in Kenya. Postulator, director. I work with Sister Esther Wangui Ishogu who is the administrator. And our work is to liaise with the dicastery in Rome. How, who do we connect with in Rome? There is a person who has been designated and who must reside in Rome. His name is Dr. Waldery Hilgerman, a, a Dutch national. He works in Rome. He is so a professor. He is, the he is the postulator in Rome. Our work is to liaise with him. So that we communicate with him, and he commu whenever Rome wants to communicate with the church in Kenya, they do that to the office of the Archbishop of Nairobi through the beatification office that where I work and where Sister Esther Wangui Ishogo works. Therefore, I am a liaison person. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Father, Father Professor Njeroge Lawrence, for taking time to give us this rich information regarding the persona, the apostolate, and the professional life of the late servant of God, Maurice Michael, Cardinal Otunga. We really appreciate that, and we wish you all the best, and we continue to jointly uh, pray for this cause so that it bears fruit. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks be to God because of the progress made so far. Thank you to all the persons that are viewing us and listening to us and thank you to Capuchin TV because of giving us this opportunity because now we have a medium of communication and it has been a very very helpful medium of communication for which we are genuinely grateful. The beatification office, Sister Esther Wangui, who is the administrator, and myself, and the Archbishop of Nairobi, our Archbishop Philip Agnolo, we are very, very grateful because of this opportunity. And God bless you and your work. Amen. Absolutely. So we continue to bring this conversation, as I said before, as we began, uh, we bring you the conversation about uh, the journey to sainthood, uh, the life and times of the servant of God, Morris Michael Cardinal Otunga. It is of importance to us as Catholic faithfuls and more importantly as a uh, a team, a television station, Capuchin TV, rooted in evangelization through broadcasting. And as we mark the sixth year of evangelization through broadcasting, we are grateful to each and every one of you who has made this possible through your prayers, through your immense support. We have been here. Right now, without wasting much time, I wish to welcome my two guests today, there is quite a lot to share of a man with so many hearts of firsts and premiers, a man who has really left a great legacy, a man who touched different people. As a Professor puts it, a global person who has an impact, had an impact, not just all the way from the village in Chebukwa, bordering Mabanga and Kandui, and uh, touching people all across uh, 
the globe. It is not something ordinary or to take it lightly. So right now, I will be joined shortly by two great people who also managed to interact closely with the servants of God, Mr. Wafula Nabutola and uh, Ms. Odawa Atie Nojewan will be joining me shortly after this break. So stay tuned. Mpendo wa muumini na mtazamaji wa Capuchin TV, tumsifu Yesu Kristu. Imetimia miaka sita tangu Mwenyezi Mungu alipotuita sisi ndugu wa Francisco wa Capuchini na kaweka juu ya mikono yetu huduma hii Katoliki ya uinjilishaji. Tunamshukuru Mungu kwa kutujalia neema nyingi na baraka kuendeleza huduma hii. Huduma hii imeendelea kuwezeshwa na washikadau wengi wewe mtazamaji ukiwa miongoni mwao. Nachukua fursa hii kwa niaba ya runinga ya Capuchin. Kushukuru sana baraza la maaskofu wa Katoliki hapa nchini KCCB kupitia kwa mwenyekiti wake Mhashamu Martin Kivuva, askofu wa Jimbo Kuu la Mombasa. Tunashukuru sana wahashamu baba zetu maaskofu kwa ukarimu wenu na kwa kuruhusu runinga hii ifike pembe zote za Jimbo zetu. Tunashukuru kwa sababu tumeeneza injili pamoja na waumini katika jimbo zote 26 hapa nchini. Tunashukuru mapadre na watawa wa kiume na wa kike katika jimbo na mashirika mbalimbali ya kitawa, baba maparoko, wakurugenzi, waratibu na wasimamizi wa taasisi, idara na vitengo mbalimbali vya kanisa kwa kujiunga nasi katika kuangazia habari na huduma njema zinazotolewa na kanisa katoliki hapa nchini. Tunashukuru sana wadhamini wetu wale wanaofikisha ujumbe kuhusu bidhaa na huduma zao kwako wewe mtazamaji kwa kuweka matangazo kupitia kwa runinga hii. Tunashukuru sana mpendo wa mtazamaji kwa kutukaribisha kwako. Umetukaribisha nyumbani kwako kwa kuchagua kutazama runinga hii. Umetukaribisha moyoni mwako kwa kutuenzi na kutufanya tuwe chaguo lako na kitambulisho chako Katoliki. Tunakushukuru wewe muumini mtazamaji kwa kutuaminia sala zako. Kila siku mapadre wa shikadau wetu wanaadhimisha ibada takatifu ya misa kwa ajili ya mahitaji na sala zako. Katika ukarimu, huruma na upendo wake Mungu kwako, tunamuomba yeye akubariki na kukulinda wewe na wapendwa wako pamoja na kuzifanikisha kazi za mikono yako. Tunakushukuru sana wewe mtazamaji unayetuwezesha na kutushikilia kwa mchango wako wa sala na mali yako ili tuendelee kutangaza na kuangazia kazi njema ya kanisa katoliki Mungu akubariki Asante sana Asante mara sita The word of the Lord came to me saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. 
I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 4 to 5. On Thursday, 31st of August 2023, the Capuchin Television team will join the Franciscan Sisters of St. Joseph in Asumbi, Homa Bay County, to mark a quadruplex celebration of religious perpetual vows, Silver Jubilee, Golden Jubilee, and Diamond Jubilee. Among the religious women who will be celebrated are six sisters who will be professing final religious vows, and these are... Twelve sisters will be marking 25 years of religious life. Three sisters will celebrate their golden jubilee. We shall also witness four Asumbi sisters celebrating Diamond Jubilee, marking 60 years of religious life. The fourfold celebrations will start at 10 a.m. at the Asumbi Mother's House grounds at St. Therese's Catholic Parish, led by His Lordship Michael Otieno Odiwa, Bishop of the Catholic Diocese of Homabe. The event will be aired live on Capuchin TV and its corresponding digital timelines. <laughs> Watching Capuchin TV, your Catholic identity. Hey, 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 yeah. <laughs> hey, 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 h